We're coming out of a season of prayer and fasting. How many of you guys felt like the Lord was actually speaking and ministering to you through this time of devotion, dedication, and consecration? Let me hear an amen. 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 I believe that God is preparing things, and I've got a box full of prayer requests, full of, of things that you guys have been praying for and people you've been praying for. And I truly believe that God has honored and is honoring the prayers that we've deposited in his throne room, that we've come to him believing and seeking him for. And I believe that he is breaking strongholds and changing lives. And so we've been looking over these last couple of weeks um, on, you know, why we want to fast and why we want to pray. And, and it makes us want to pray when we understand it from his perspective and the power that's behind it. We've been looking at how strongholds can be broken if we step into these activities. And I've been contemplating and thinking about worship and thinking about praising God. And and we've been doing this and God's been moving among us. So I'm excited about what we're going to be doing on the 26th and the baptism that's going to be joined with that. um, Because I believe that God is going to continue to stoke and fan into flames that which he is doing in us for our families, for our church in our region. Can somebody give me a mighty amen? Amen. 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 But I was contemplating this idea of strongholds. How many of you have one? How many of you have encountered one? Maybe you might not know it by that name and that word, but you've got something that you just can't break out of. There is something that just is not coming, you're not overcoming through your faith. You're not being able to have victory over that in your life. I don't know what the stronghold may be. Maybe it's a sickness, a disease. Maybe it's, you know, a habit or an issue. Maybe it could be, you know, a person. I don't know what that stronghold may be. But you know, you've encountered some places that you feel powerless and it's impossible And I was contemplating strongholds within the scriptures and how they have been broken and and how chains were being able to be released and and, and, uh, jail cells broken apart. And you find so many different examples within the scriptures. But I kept coming back to the walls of Jericho. And how many of you have ever heard the story of Jericho? It's right there in the the beginning books of the Bible, the book of Judges. There's a story, in the book of Joshua, sorry, there's a story of how God is leading the people into the promised land, and when they are coming into their conquest, the first city they come to is the city of Jericho. It's at the gate, it's at the beginning, it's at the entrance of the promised land. And maybe you've heard the song when you were a little kid, because that, I remember that when I was a little kid, um, the little song about the walls of Jericho falling down. Joshua Fit the battle of Jericho, Jericho, Jericho. I don't know if you, I'm not a great singer, so I'm not going to bore you with that. But there's a little song and, and, and there's like a great idea and theme of music and worship and praise to God that is surrounding that whole story. But within the context of strongholds, as I was reading in the New Testament, in the book of Hebrews, if you grab your Bibles, there's one verse that says this, Hebrews verse 11 Uh, Chapter 11, verse 30. By faith. By what? By faith. The walls of Jericho fell. After the people had marched around them for seven days. I often, you know, think in my mind, by worship by song, by the trumpet blasts, by the marching around the city, by the prayer walk around that city and those walls, the strongholds, the strong structures, the mighty walls, the fortification of this city were broken. And here Hebrews tells us, by faith, the walls of Jericho fell. Lord, I pray that you would just help us to anchor our thoughts this morning on a few things. Strongholds may be plenty within our lives. The requests were several, Lord God. They were many. Some of the situations dire and desperate, impossible before man's eyes. 
But Lord, I know that you are a God that breaks strongholds. Help us, Father, as we contemplate your word. In Jesus' name. I'm just struck by this scripture because I know that what happened on that day in that story makes absolutely no sense. And when we are facing struggles and situations in our lives, I believe that all of us, either we're in a situation or we're gonna face a situation one day, and I'm not trying to prophesy negativity over your life. I'm just speaking to you about the realities of human nature and the existence in which we are finding ourselves in. There are troubles in this world. And if you don't have any, maybe I could share the load. Make my burden a little little easier, okay? Um, We're going to find troubles. We're going to find struggles. We're going to go through some things. The singular nature of this event, it stands out as a story that God showed up and gave his people incredible victory. And they were facing an impossible situation. It was just not possible to experience victory by human standards and by the natural eye in that situation. God had promised them to have victory. And how many of you have read the scriptures, you've, you've gone to church for a certain amount of time, or you've heard enough about the church, and you have this general sense that maybe the people of God will be victorious? Anybody have that sense? Maybe you've read, you know, in the New Testament, and you've read into the book of Revelations, and you realize, what well, there's going to be a victory. There's going to be a culmination of this grand plan and beautiful design that God has. There is something great in store. But just like the people of God who came into the promised land, who showed up there, God had said, I'm going to give you this land. I'm going to make you a mighty nation. All of the nations will be blessed by you. They have all of the words. They have these notions and that reality and these promises percolating inside of their hearts. But they're right there in front of them, standing, erected right in front of them are the walls of Jericho. How many of you know that God has a plan for your life? How many of you believe that God wants to work something beautiful in your family? How many of you have heard it said that you will have trouble in this world, but do not grow weary because you will be victorious? Anybody? Okay, but despite all of those truths, do you have a giant in front of you? Despite all of those truths, is there an impossible stronghold in front of your eyes? Do you find yourself at times looking at an impossible situation and something that you feel like you have no power to change? I know I do. I've been waiting for a transformer to show up so we can move into a house. And, and the builder, my cousin, has been waiting for that too because he's got bills and bills and bills and difficulties and stresses and strains that are mounting on his business because of that. There are some of you I'm talking to and you're looking at a desperate situation where there is an impossible medical report and you're looking at that stronghold and you've read in the scriptures that by his stripes we are healed, that he's healing our souls and bringing us into salvation and that he has come to give us life and life abundantly. Yet right here I have this medical disease that is robbing me of my health. Maybe some of you have heard that Joshua himself said that for me and my household, we shall serve the Lord. But you're staring at a child that is rebelling against the word of God and bringing such havoc into their lives through the choices that they're making that don't line up to God's grand design. And it seems like a stronghold. See, the reality is they're all promises from God. But then the reality is that there is strongholds before our our eyes and before God's people. There are challenges. We go through these things. And yet God gave the people a great victory despite the fact that there was a stronghold before them. And how did it happen? Hebrews tells us two words, by faith. By faith. By faith, the people of God experienced victory. And I want us to just investigate this incredible story just a little bit. What sort of faith was it that caused the walls of Jericho to come crumbling down? Let's look at a couple of them. If you go to the story in in the book of uh, Joshua, you'll find over there the story of Jericho. If you ever step into and have the privilege and opportunity to go to Israel and you're surveying the land, you're going to come to the, the place where the remains of this ancient city is called Jericho. 
To get there, you have to travel down a mountainside and go down uh, into a river road that's coming out of the Sea of Galilee. You'll encounter the place that people believe was where the city of Jericho used to be. And it's an important place because it was at the beginning of, of, of the land of Canaan there. You're going to come across this nation. You're going to experience this, this mighty gateway fortress, this incredible land that was going to flow with milk and honey. At the entrance had this place that they had to deal with. Any invading army wouldn't just be able to bypass or go around it. They had to go through it. They had to encounter it. They had to account for it. It was way too large to overlook and way too strong to be ignored. And so the city of Jericho was there. And it represented a couple of things for the people of God. As they were contemplating God's promise, you're going to inherit this land. You're going to conquer this land. You're going to have this nation. It's going to be a land of flowing with milk and honey, all these great things. Here's the reality of what Jericho represented. It represented a people that had pagan beliefs, a people who worshipped other idols and gods, people who did not live upright or by the standards which God had told his people. It was a city that also represented some significance because it was strategically right there at the entrance of that land. You want to get into here, you got to go through us. It was a city that was humanly impossible for them to deal with. And all of these realities are crucial as you understand the story of Jericho. The corrupt Canaanite religion was emphasizing idolatry and immorality and all of those things that would not be able to coincide with the true worship of Jehovah, with the worship of Yahweh. They would not be able to worship God and live in conjunction with that immoral society. They had to be confronted and they would have to be defeated. Not only that, the city had a spiritual importance and a military importance because the walls were so high, they seemed almost to reach the skies. If you read the accounts in the book of Deuteronomy, the city must have been, must and should and would need to be completely destroyed if the people of God, the Jewish people of the Lord, would be ever able to feel safe in that space. How can you go about your business and, and fulfill the plans of God when you know that right there there's an imposing enemy that is towering over you that could come and wreak havoc in your life at any moment? It would have to be destroyed. And if you look at the story, I feel like you're going to come to this reality and to this understanding that the type of faith that defeated Jericho is a faith in spite of impossible odds. Can you say that to yourself? Let yourself hear that. It's faith despite impossibility. Archaeologists have done studies and they've unearthed things over the years and they have corroborated the realities that Jericho was truly a magnificent, incredible fortress. They've uncovered that the city that Joshua saw actually didn't just have one wall, but it had two walls. It had the outer wall, the inner wall, and both were built on a slope, making it virtually impregnable. It was built in a way where if you have ever studied military movies or seen an action film, you know that those who have the high ground have the advantage over the attacking forces. You can defend a position from a higher ground a lot better than you can from a lower position. And so these walls were erected on a slope. Because Jericho is in one of the oldest cities in the world, it was built and destroyed and rebuilt many times throughout the centuries. And there's been all of these details uncovered through archaeology. The constant construction and destruction of that city caused it from being a place that was on this plane to every time it was rebuilt, it kept getting higher and higher. And so you got this city built on a slope. There's an embankment to get up to it. There are two walls. It becomes pretty difficult if you're thinking, I need to overcome this city and take over. I'm going to win this fortress. It's not something that's very easy to do. The odds are not stacked in your favor. The mound of Jericho was surrounded by a rampart, if you want to add to the issue, with stone and a stone wall that was all encased around it. 
The retaining wall was some about 12 to 15 foot high. And on top of that, there was, you know, another mud brick wall of about six feet. And bottom line, you got 20 to 26 feet of walls that you got to deal with. And you got to take and overcome while there's, you know, a presence, a military presence that's there defending those walls and trying to keep you at bay and keep you back. I think you catch the picture. The odds were not stacked in their favor. There were several thousands of people there who were dead set on keeping their fortress and retaining their position and continuing in their lifestyle and perpetuating what they believed was their life. And so it was not in Joshua's favor What could they do in the face of those seeming impossibilities? They had no other way to tear down the walls or enter the city. They didn't have an inn. They didn't have a back door. They didn't have another strategy. They just knew that they needed to overcome this city because God said, I'm going to give you this land. And by the way, here's the walls right in front of you. They couldn't breach the walls themselves, but what could they do? If you look at the faith, by faith, the the walls of Jericho came tumbling down. By faith, it was a faith that dealt with impossible odds, but it was also a faith that had to obey a very odd plan. A very odd plan. In Joshua chapter 6, God instructed the Jews to do a number of unusual things. I want you guys to do these things that make no sense. How many of you have ever heard God tell you to do something that makes no sense? If you haven't, just wait. I think it's part of the initiation. It's part of the journey. It's part of what it means to be a disciple of Jesus, to go and do things that just don't make sense. Jesus tells the disciples, go to this city. You're going to find this colt. I want you to grab it. Oh, you're not the owner of the donkey and the colt. I want you to grab it. And if the owner asks you, just tell him the master has need of it. Uh, what? You want me to go steal someone's donkeys? No, God had made other plans. He worked on people's hearts. He, he had, God will ask us to do things that make no sense. Abraham, I want you to leave your household. I want you to leave everything that you know that is near and dear to you, your culture, your language, your family. I want you to leave the comforts of your home. I want you to go to a place. Oh, what, what place, God? Yeah, I'll tell you. I'll tell you as you go. I won't tell you beforehand. Okay, that seems odd, Lord. Hey, Gideon, I want you to go and face this mighty army. I want you to take a hold of the people and win a great military victory. Okay, God, I got all these thousands of people. No, 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 Gideon, that's too many. I want you to narrow them down. I want you to face the tens of thousands, Gideon, with a little band of 300 men. God will ask us to do things that seem impossible, that seem odd. He's got plans that don't quite make sense. And for Joshua, he says it like this. He says, I want you in chapter 6 to march around the town once a day for six days. That's in verse 3. I want you then to march with the Ark of the Covenant, verse 4. And also in verse 4, I want you to put seven priests in front of the Ark. So I want you to march around six days, put the Ark of the Covenant, and put the priests before the Ark. And I want you to go, okay, on this journey. On the seventh day, when you march around, I want you to do it seven times. Not only that, I want you to have the priest blow the ram's horn. I want you to make some noise. I want you to shout with some instruments. And then tell the people themselves to shout, verse 5. And when the people shout, the walls will come down. And when the walls come down, enter the city and conquer it. I don't know about you, but that doesn't seem like a military plan. That does not seem like a plan that was worked out in the command room. As the maps are there and the the troops are mobilized and the figurines are are decided, I don't don't foresee that some general or captain or whatever would say, all right, I got an idea. Let's get some trumpets. Let's uh, let's get people ready to march. Oh, don't worry about taking the swords and the guns and all that stuff. I want you to just do this. It doesn't make sense. God asks them to move forward with everything. A weird plan. And then on top of that, if you look at what Joshua says in chapter 6, he tells them this. He says, let's, let's add a few details. I want you guys to be perfectly silent as you're marching around the city. I can't imagine six days of marching around the city in like a silent protest and only blasting some, some horns. I want you to put the soldiers in front of the priests and behind the ark. And 
Also, have the priest blow the ram's horn, the shofar, continuously. For six days, they marched around the city, and then they returned to their camp. They went, marched around, returned to their camp. They went, marched around, returned to their camp. They did this, and on the seventh day, at the end of the seventh time, around the city, the priest sounded a long blast, and the people shouted as loud as they could. It does not make sense. This seems more like, you know, my high school pep rally type of thing than it does, uh, 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 let's, let's, uh, let's go and overcome a stronghold. Let's win a military victory. It makes no sense, church. But yet, by faith, the walls of Jericho came tumbling down. Marching plus horns plus shouting equals, are you kidding me? What? All you have is a whole bunch of noise. You have a whole bunch of activity in terms of people walking around, but nothing that seems to line up with the reality. If, if we were to try to do this, like there, there is a great wall that you can see from space called the Great Wall of China. If we were to just march around the Great Wall of China saying, hey, I know how we're going to break this thing down. We're going to march around it. We're going to sing some songs and we're going to, you know, blast some, some, some trumpets. And this whole thing that we can see from, from the space center, from, from orbiting Earth, this, this man-made structure, we're going to have it come crumbling down. If I were to tell you that, you'd be like, yeah, Brian, sure. You need to, you know, come down to Earth a little bit. It doesn't seem... Like, this is going to make any sense. But it's at this point that we encounter something that's absolutely incredible in the story of how by faith the walls of Jericho came tumbling down. The walls fell because faith, the faith that God gives is a faith that he's also involved in. See, faith that God would be involved in the plan was crucial for the people who are marching around the city. There's a reality that if you look at the story, that God said he's gonna give them the victory. You are gonna be victorious. You're gonna overcome your struggles. You're gonna overcome this stronghold. You're gonna be victorious in your issue. And he gives that to them before he gives them the plan. You are going to have the city delivered unto you. If you look at chapter six, verse two. See, I have delivered Jericho into your hands along with the king and its fighting men. He gave them that word before he gave them the plan of what to do to accomplish it. How many of you need to just let that percolate in your spirit? God has already told you you're going to be victorious. Maybe you don't know how you're going to do it. You don't know where you're going to do it and how it's going to be fulfilled. How it's going to play out in your life. But God has already told you, I'm going to give you the victory. You're going to be successful. Past tense. Not present, not future. I have delivered Jericho into your hands. It's a done deal. The walls are not even there. I don't see the walls. I see your victory. Man, I love it when my God says that over my life. I love it when I catch a glimpse of the reality that though in front of me in my physical eyes there are walls, but through God's eyesight there is a plane. There is no mountain. He says, by faith, you can tell this mountain to be cast into the sea and it shall be done. By faith, you will fulfill and do exploits. It is incredible when God tells us in the past tense that our victory is already at hand. It shouldn't surprise anybody who believes in God, that this is how he operates. He can do things like that. He can speak like that. He can declare things in the past tense, even though for us, it's still in the present tense. He can declare things for us in the past tense that we're gonna experience in the future tense. He can tell us that he has paid for us our sins, past, present, and future, that he has already made a plan of redemption for us on our worst day and our best day. He is there for us no matter what we experience, and he has fulfilled things because he sees the end and he fulfills the end, even though we're walking through it. God is faithful. 
He is good. But also, faith that God would somehow give them victory is seen in evidence in the fact that God put himself in the middle of their plans. God put himself in the very center of their plans. If you need to look at this, verse four, the Ark of the Covenant was the the spot, the place where the presence of God was said to abide. And God says, I want you to take the Ark of the Covenant. I want you to march around the city. See, I don't want you to just go yourselves. I don't want you to put the military commanders and the priests, although they represent God. I want to take the very Ark of the Covenant, and I want that object. That is the place that by his divine grace should be where the presence of God abides. I want my Ark to go around the city as well. In other words, I'm coming with you. See, God says, you need to have faith that God is involved in your victory because he has already said, I shall never leave you or forsake you, that I will be with you to the very ends of the age, that I have given you the spirit of sonship. If, if he's called us to be a father, God is not the absentee dad. He is present He is with us. He puts himself in the middle of the issue, in the middle of the problem. He goes before us. He was with them. God was present. All normal military options for these guys are off the table. It's the people of God with an incredibly insane plan, but with the presence of God that makes this thing possible. See, you might not know how you're going to overcome your stronghold, but, and God may give you a crazy plan to do so. He may tell you through convictions or through his own personal way for you that this is how you're going to work it. It's not how she's going to work it. It's how you're going to overcome it, not how she's going to overcome it. And, and God says, it doesn't matter how I tell you to do this. What matters is this. I'm with you as you do it. And so these men and women who were marching needed to latch on to some faith. There's another aspect to consider here. What exactly were the people of Jericho thinking all week long as these guys are looking at this scene outside their window, outside their walls? There is a group, a nation of people that are marching. There are priests in their robes. There's a a shiny thing, a box with angels on top. What is this ark thing that they're carrying around? They may not even have known it was called an ark. Why are they blasting? Why are they so quiet when they're doing this? They're not talking. It's weird. Imagine them watching this scene. All they hear is the ram's horn. The Bible tells us that they shut the gates for fear came upon them. Joshua chapter 6 verse 1. This happened before the marching ever began. I think that the cumulative effect, the, the, the total picture here, would have created a sense of mounting dread inside of the city. The people who have these 26-foot walls, who's on a slant, an impossible great military advantage point, they are inside those walls quaking with fear at what they see in front of them. The people who were marching could never breach the walls. They would never be able to overcome those walls. They were at the deficit from a military perspective. But on the other hand, the people inside were trapped and they dared not get out of the city because there's this crazy bunch of people circling around us. There's this weird situation happening outside. And plus, they heard the news that the Jewish people had crossed over the Red Sea. They were on dry land. They had heard that they were coming and they had defeated two Amorite kings and that they were coming and they wanted to uh, take hold of the land. There were these kings, Sihon and Og in Joshua chapter two, verses eight and 10, that they had already fallen before the people of God, this Jewish nation. And so dread is overcoming them. And now they see these very people are marching around our city. Church, I want you to understand that when you are facing an impossible situation, it may look impossible to you. It may look desperate and dire and completely like you're at a disadvantage. But I want you to understand from a spiritual perspective in the spiritual realm, the enemy that is before you, deep down, behind the scenes, behind the facade, behind the the, the voice, behind the speaking and the quaking and the shake, there is a trembling and a fear that is before them. The Bible says that even the demons know the word of God and they tremble. 
when Jesus came on the scene and the, the demon possessed and the men and women who were conflict, uh, afflicted by evil spirits, when they would encounter Jesus Christ, they would scream out and they would say, please have mercy, or did you come to banish us already? They would submit themselves with great fear. Why? Because they knew that they were already defeated. The people of Jericho are going through that psychological warfare because God is in the midst and he is granting his people victory. Marching plus the horns plus the shouting plus God means that the walls of Jericho is going to come down. I want you to understand that no matter what you're going through, you may have a crazy strategy. You may be struck with a moment of intuition and wisdom and you feel like you've got the plan and the strategy to move forward. But I want you to know that despite everything else, what's going to give you victory is the Lord. It's God who gives us the victory. It's God who's going to, it's not the connections that you may be forging. It's not, you know, the, 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 the people giving you a hand up. It's not the folks that might grant you some favor. It's not your intelligence or your degrees. It won't be your bank account and your reserves. It's not going to be the resources that you have. What's going to grant you the victory is God, for he is the one that owns the kettle on a thousand hills. He's the one that has all the silver and gold. He's the one that created all of creation. He's the one who determines to the waves, you go this far and no further. Who grants us the victory is God himself. And so... By faith, Jericho was defeated because it was a faith that realized God is in the midst of this plan. Not only that, faith destroyed the walls of Jericho because it was a faith that expressed itself in persevering obedience. There's one thing for us to have faith and say that faith moves mountains and that the, the just shall live by faith and all these incredible things are beautiful to say and to express and to believe. It's wonderful. But let me tell you, if God is the true hero of this story, as he is, then we have to face the reality that he gave a plan, he was present in it, but he's not the one who marched around the city by himself. He's not the one who made the heavens proclaim the blasts of the ram's horn. He used the people. The people had to march around the city for six days. They were the ones that had to do it multiple times on the seventh. They were the ones who had to speak out uh, the mighty shouts. They were the ones that had to blow the ram's horn. They were the ones that had to persevere in obedience to God because God honors obedience in the realm of faith. Obedience and faith go hand in hand. Without obedience, there truly is no faith. We can all say we are mighty people of faith. All right, then show me. There's a correlation between faith and working out our faith. Faith and demonstration. Because we have faith, we can't help but act. Because we have faith in God, we can't help but move into what he has in store for us and do what he's calling us to do. Think about this. These guys were diligent in their preparations. They had to get up every day. They had to go mobilize their family. Let's go. Let's march. The priests had to go in a certain order. They had to be diligent and dedicated to do the work. Get the Ark of the Covenant to go. We have to have enough energy to march around this city. We have to have enough uh, in store for us to blow the ram's horn. They had to be diligent. They had to be disciplined. They had to be careful. These guys had to be patient and do it repetitively. These guys had to do a bunch of different things that you can look at them and say, these were obedient men and women. God could have said to them, look, I want you guys to sit down and watch me do this thing. He could have. He's done that before. There's a story with the King Jehoshaphat going through, a, through an issue, and he calls a mighty fast and a praise service uh, in, the, in the land of Israel. And what happens is that God goes and confuses the enemy as these guys are praising. But even in that, they are praising him. They are obedient in doing what God's called them to do. There is a correlation, and we can't get out of it. It has to happen. I've already shared with you a couple weeks back when we were talking about prayer that God has decided in his sovereign plan to relegate dominion to you and I. The heavens are the Lord, but the earth belongs to man. He's given us this incredible authority and dominion. 
And because he chooses to operate that way, you and I can't get off the hook. We need to do our parts. We have to engage God in his plan. It's part of his natural order that he uses people to accomplish his purpose. It's part of his natural order that he causes the wall of Jericho to fall down by the actions of the people's obedient faith. This is the precise reason why the author of Hebrews puts the story of Jericho in the book of Hebrews, close to that chapter of great faith. Why? Because people had to take action. They had to march around the city. See, I don't know whatever it is that you are facing, the stronghold in your life. I can tell you this. God ain't going to remove it out of your life just like that. He can, but he's chosen to do it through your partnership. See, sometimes people come to the church and they say, Pastor, I want you to pray for my deliverance. Pastor, I want you to pray for my family. Pastor, I want you to do this. Pastor, can you help me with that? I I want the church to do this for me. And it's like, I'm always for prayer. I believe that God is a God who answers prayer. God is a God who, who honors our fast and our dedication, our worship. He is all of that. But let me just tell you, God will not do for you what you're not willing to do. He will not do for you that which he's already ordained and declared, that if you want to accomplish certain things, these are the requisites, these are the preconditions that you need to fulfill in order to experience that. We talked about how if we want to have power and experience God's grace in our lives, then we need to pray and seek his face. If we want to be used by God, we need to know God first and foremost. He's not going to use us if we don't know him. We need to do our part and God will do his. There is a correlation and an interplay, a dependency because God determined that to be the case. Pastor, pray for my deliverance. Okay, I'll pray. But what are you doing to stay free? What are you doing to gain freedom? What are you doing to wipe away the issues? Yes, God says, I want you to wake up. I want you to wash yourself of what is wrong, what is filthy, what is broken. I want you guys to rid this nation and this land of Jericho because of their immorality and what they're doing. You're going to conquer the land, but you got to do your part. And then I will allow my plans and my promises to be fulfilled here. We want the easy way out. We want God to do everything. But God is saying, I've already done it. It's yes and amen. Now enter into it. Step into the process of being free from your stronghold. You've got to walk out in obedience. Their faith faced impossible odds. The faith that had incredibly odd plans. A faith that God was in the midst of the thing. Faith that acted and persevered in obedience. But by faith, Jericho demonstrates this here. The people of God demonstrate in the victory over Jericho that faith that is acted in spite of doubts is a faith that wins. See, it's one thing for us to um, have a perfect faith and we just move forward. But I can tell you in my own life, faith rarely comes surging with this feeling that everything is going to work out 100% of the time. I remember when God called me to leave my corporate job that I thought I was going to do. You know, I was with the students on Friday night and we were talking about identity and what you think you want to be when you grow up. I says, I'm trying to figure it out still because I'm not grown yet. I got kids and all this stuff. I, I need to figure out what I'm going to be doing, right? And what I just want to hear the Lord say for me one day, well done, my good and faithful servant. So everything I need to become and be and and experience from God, I'm looking forward to that. So I can hear those words. But we were talking about identity. And I told him I wanted to be a pizza man when I was younger. I did. I wanted to buy my mama orange Camaro. And come home and say, Mom, here's your pizzas. That's the identity I thought I was going to be when I was a kid. And then I grew up thinking, you know, all right, maybe a pizza man's not the best, so maybe I'll become a kung fu master. And I wanted that for a while. And took some classes, didn't really stick with it. And then at some point, I'm like, man, I wish I could be this or that. And you know, like we go through seasons and we think we want to be all these things, right? And God has his plans. But it came to a point where I went to college and I said, I want to be a businessman. I want to, I want to travel the world and do business. And hey, by the way, I speak Portuguese. I speak English. Maybe not the best. I speak English better uh, than Portuguese and Spanish. But maybe I could use that and make some money. So I'll travel abroad. Now, I'll work for a big company because I loved video games. So I thought I'll work for Sony in South America, 
speaking Portuguese or Spanish, making a lot of money because I don't belong there, right? Because I'm, I'm from, I'm, I was born in Brazil, but I grew up in America and Brazilians don't really accept me as Brazilian. That was my childhood. I was teased. Yo, you're not a Brazilian. You never went to school in Brazil. You're, you're American, but whatever. The Lord's dealt with my heart on that. But I thought I'm going to be this business person in South America and started working in that, went to college, went to business school, and, and did international business, took international business classes and international protocol and, and all that other stuff. And I started working in that field, worked for a company that was actually owned by a Japanese company and started growing my career and had opportunities to advance and all these different things. And then this nagging feeling that I was not where God wanted me to be, and God said, I want you to go in a different direction. Take your vacation days and go take some summer classes in school, classes at a Bible school. Learn more about me. And I went and I got discouraged because everyone there knew exactly who they were going to be and what they were going to do. And I had this stronghold and this thought in my mind, I don't know what God wants me to do yet. And while I was going through that whole process, this saying and this idea of, hey, the just shall live by faith. That we are to live by faith. Oh, it's very easy to say that. But when I had to, you know, draft my resignation letter and tell my boss, I'm actually going to be leaving the company so I can become a full-time student. I am going to forego my income and give up my medical benefits and give up the, you know, a vesting schedule of the 401k match that you guys have for me. Uh, and I'm going to go live by faith. It took me a little while. See, God calls us to experience faith and to act on our faith despite doubts. If somebody is painting you a picture that perfect faith is a faith that has no doubts, then let me just tell you, there's a man that shows up to Jesus and says, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. See, faith is acting on the belief part in spite of the doubting parts. It's acting on the part that you know a little bit about and the ones that God has allowed to percolate in your spirit and saying, despite that unbelief, despite the fact that I don't have all the answers, despite the fact that it all doesn't make sense, I got to march, how is that a military plan? I'm going to act anyways. And so that's what the people did. I don't know how this applies to your life, but maybe you've got something staring you down. You've got to act in belief. We do this for everything. If you go to the doctor, you got to first have faith and believe that the doctor can actually help you. Before you get on an airplane, you have to have enough faith that there's actually a human being in the cockpit, not a monkey. Like, you've got to just act on the... You don't go there. I have never been invited into the cockpit of a plane. Not saying that I care for that and I want that. That, like, oh, that's awesome if you have. Like, great, good for you. But I've never done that, and I've had enough faith to believe in the little bit that I do know. Every single time I get on an airplane, I pray to the Lord. Lord, I pray. I know it's a lot more dangerous to drive a car than to fly an airplane, statistically speaking, but I can't. I'm being honest, I always pray, Lord, please don't let this plane fall down. But I have enough faith to get in there. The parts that I understand, I move with it, despite the doubts. Faith that acts in spite of doubts is the faith that overcame the strongholds of Jericho. You don't have to be 100% there. Could you be a percentage there and still act anyways? See, I, I believe that if you start reading the scriptures and understanding the nature of God and the promises of God and the plans of God and what God has ordained and what he has fulfilled and when the promises that he has already spoken, the end that he already has painted and established and declared, if you start lining those things up in your eyesight, and allow them to percolate in your heart. I believe that no matter when the doubt comes, you're going to still act out and move in conjunction with this plan. If you haven't, it'll be very hard for you to take a step of faith and move forward. I'm going to 
condense it to say all this. Faith has to be acted upon. It will not make sense. It might come up against impossible odds, but God is in it, and so you take action obediently and you move forward faithfully. God told them the walls would fall down, but they had to march. They went and they did their part. Living by faith means acting on the belief part. It means taking the step of faith, however small, however halting, however difficult, however unsure of yourself, but moving out anyways, and God will fulfill his plan and do the impossible as you move forward in that faith. God started an impossible thing when he gave them the idea, and he carried it to, into reality before their very eyes. And he did it through a man named Joshua. But let me tell you, Joshua is a resemblance of our Lord Jesus. And that brings to this final thought. I want you to just think about this. The real battle of Jericho was not with the Canaanites. The real battle was in the hearts of God's people. See, the enemy was shut within their walls, terrified. They didn't pick up a sword, a spear, a bow, or anything to oppose God's people. The entire battle was fought within the hearts of God's people. Let me just tell you, although there might be a physical enemy against you, there might be situations and unseen forces that are impossibly mounting up against you, let me just tell you this, the battle resides squarely in your heart. And I love that because it tells me that I don't have to put the issue onto somebody else. I don't have to depend on someone else getting better. I don't have to depend on God moving on someone else's life. I have to depend on him moving upon me and me experiencing all that he has for me. I don't have to wait for God to move on some, you know, uh, person that's going to release the favor and the answer that I need. I need to just ask God move upon me to taste and see the goodness of God. Move upon me, Lord God, to have faith and experience you. Lord, move upon me. In the difficulties of the life that you guys are facing, in the difficulties of your life that you shall face, those strongholds can be overcome. If God was faithful to overcome it for a nation in the most impossible of ways, it can be overcome in your life. Why? Because Jesus Christ is for you. Jesus is with you. If the people would believe what God had said, if they would risk the public humiliation, if those walls did not come down, if they would be faithful just to do what seemed absurd from a human perspective, God could step in and do what he could. And God in his perfect plan said, I'm going to become a human being and I'm going to overcome the greatest stronghold that ever existed by being made in the image of man, taken on flesh, living perfectly, dying, going to a grave, raising himself back up through the power of the Holy Spirit, the power of God on Easter Sunday. Jesus has overcome it. Faith, mighty faith. The promise, it sees. It looks to God alone. It laughs at the impossible and it cries out, it shall be done. Our text says that by faith, the mighty walls of that city came to the ground. How will you overcome your walls? How will you overcome your strongholds, your impossibilities? Where do you find your faith? If you move to Hebrews chapter 12, we find the very answer is so clear. Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith. He is the author and the finisher of faith. He is the one that provides it, the one that sustains it, the one that fulfills it. He's the captain of our salvation. He is the redeemer that we so desperately need. We need to keep our eyes fixed on him. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Did you know that Joshua is the name of Jesus? Joshua in the Old Testament means Savior. Jesus 
is the Savior. Jesus is the one that will lead us into the victory. When he leads the way, I don't care what wall you are, you've got to come tumbling down. So will you stand with me this morning? Lord, I pray that every man and woman in this place, everyone listening online today, Lord, will faith just rise up inside of hearts? There are impossible situations, things that we've prayed to you for, Lord God. We've left in your hands. We've dedicated fasting time to, to see changes and to experience more of your presence and align ourselves more with you that we may be the men and women who get to experience you in your saving grace and your great plan and the plan that works out impossibilities in our lives. Lord, I pray that you would compound faith inside of our hearts, that you would give us the courage to do the things that we need to do in order to see you do the things that you alone can do. Father, move upon hearts today. Those who are growing weary and being obedient to crazy commands. Those, Father, who feel like they've got a strategy, but Lord, they need your presence. Father, those who are just looking at the impossibility before them, Lord, I just ask you that you would encourage every heart. If there is an impossible thing before them, there is a seed of an incredible testimony right there present with them. Father, for those who have not yet come to know you, I pray that you, the wall tearing down God that you are, the Savior that redeems the people, the one who makes us right with the Father and tears down every impossibility, Pray that you would become real in every heart today. That you would move upon lives this morning. That you would fulfill your great plan inside of hearts. In Jesus' mighty name. In Jesus' mighty name. Faith comes by hearing his word. By staying in his presence. Being around his people. So if this morning you want to just anchor your faith to the reality that God is true and working for you, and you just want to hear some encouragement from someone else and pray alongside you, we invite you to come. The altars are open. As the team worships, we'll pray for you. May the love of our Lord, who gave his one and only son, the grace of Jesus who endured that plan, we decided to chase after the 99. Out of the one, the 99, the 99, the one, he chased after all. And the fellowship of his Holy Spirit that empowers us and emboldens us, may that be our portion today. May God bless you.